If you are listening to this message, you are about to listen to a re-recording of an episode I have previously done. I am going back to my season one episodes and re-recording them because of the dog snoring, horrible audio quality, and general newbiness. I am not saying the redo is going to be great, but perhaps those who cannot tune out the noises before can now listen. There will be some changes to the episodes, but overall remain the same, but there will also still be some noises that I absolutely cannot help, and for that, I do apologize. Welcome to True Crime and Coke. I am your host, Eve, and this podcast is about true crime, disappearances, conspiracies, hauntings, and anything strange or unusual, all while drinking an excessive amount of Diet Coke. If you have a story to share, I would love to hear it. Just email me at truecrimeandcoke at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this podcast and want it to continue, please rate me five stars, tell your friends about me, and consider supporting me on Patreon. The links are in the show notes. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin. Hi, it's Eve, and welcome to the redo of episode 23 about Marion Parker. At that time, I was very busy, and I read an article from the website medium.com, and the article was written by Heather Monroe called The Horrifying Murder of Marion Parker. So, let's get started. Los Angeles of the 1920s was no stranger to crime. The City of Angels had long ago lost its innocence. But in December of 1927, the gruesome murder of Marion Parker would rattle even the most hardened Angelino to the core. Successful banker Perry Marion Parker married a beautiful woman named Geraldine Heisel in 1906. The couple lived at 1631 South Wilton Place, Los Angeles, California. On January 14, 1907, the Parkers were blessed with a son, Perry Willard Parker. Eight years later, on October 11, 1915, they welcomed identical twin daughters, Marjorie Helen and Marion Francis. On December 15, 1927, a well-dressed and well-spoken young man entered the office of Mount Vernon Junior High School in Los Angeles, California, where the 12-year-old twins were enrolled. He introduced himself as Mr. Cooper and asked the school registrar, Miss Mary Holt, for the Parker girl. Mr. Cooper told Miss Holt that his boss, Perry Parker, was in a terrible car accident and requesting his daughter right away. When Miss Holt asked which one, the man seemed surprised and answered Marion. School secretary, Miss Naomi Flinton, brought the child to the office, and the two women excused Marion to leave the stranger. They watched as she sauntered down the walkway. Mr. Cooper said to Marion, Don't cry, little girl. I'll take you to your daddy. She climbed into the passenger seat of a coupe, and Mr. Cooper spirited her away forever. Side note, there was also another scenario that actually happened, supposedly when this man went to the school and the teacher said which one. He didn't say Marion because he didn't know their names. He said the younger one. But either way, it's horrible that they let the child go with the stranger. Geraldine became concerned when Marjorie came home without her twin, so she telephoned the girl's schoolmates and friends. No one had seen Marion. Concern turned into fear when Perry received a telegram that read, Do positively nothing till you receive a special delivery letter, Marion Parker. In a short time, a second telegram arrived, and it said, Marion, secure. Use good judgment. Interference with my plans, dangerous. Marion Parker, George Fox. Perry contacted school officials who explained what happened with Mr. Cooper. At this point, Perry called the police. It was clear that someone abducted his 12-year-old daughter. Officers took Marion's description, four foot six inches tall, around 100 pounds, dressed in an English print dress, brown Oxford shoes, and tan stockings. She had straight, dark brown hair bobbed to her jawline. She looked exactly like Marjorie. They also obtained a description of the man, white, between 25 and 30, about 5 foot 8 inches tall and 150 pounds. He wore a heavy grayish brown overcoat, black shoes, and a dark hat. These descriptions went to press right away. Chief of Detectives Herman Klein ordered every officer to take part in the case and expressed his grave concerns about the girl's whereabouts. Perry and Geraldine grew more overcome with worry as the hours passed and none of these efforts revealed a single trace of Marion. 
The next day, a ransom note arrived at the Parker home demanding $15,000 in gold certificates for the safe return of Marion. This note was followed by two like it, all three ominously signed Fate, Death, and the Fox. One letter included postscript in Marion's handwriting. Daddy, please do what this man tells you or he'll kill me if you don't. Your loving daughter, Marion Parker. The Fox sent instructions to deliver the money to 10th Street and Gramercy Place. Perry followed the instructions. Sadly, the police who were casing the Parker home followed Perry without his knowledge. The kidnapper fled as soon as he caught on. The kidnapper sent more letters assuring Perry that the child was alive. For now, he claimed Marion, during the botched handover, had wondered why her dad hadn't helped her. The fox asked Perry to wait for a telephone call and cautioned him to keep law enforcement away. That call came at 7.35 p.m. on December 17th. The kidnapper instructed Perry to bring money to West 5th Street and South Manhattan Place in Los Angeles. Perry was there, cash in hand by 8 p.m. A Chrysler Coupe pulled up slowly next to Perry's car. The man in the front seat, his face concealed with a bandana, brandished a firearm and asked Perry if he saw it. Perry replied in the affirmative and asked if Marion was all right. Perry saw her slumped in the passenger seat. She's sleeping, the kidnapper reassured the distressed father, and Perry handed over the money. In that instant, the car drove up the street and pushed Marion onto the curb at 432 Manhattan Place. Perry ran to his daughter, still believing the child was asleep. He didn't bother putting the car in park. He cradled his little girl and noticed that her face was pale. Not just that, but all of her limbs were missing. Any hope he had was replaced with enormous grief as he realized his little daughter was dead. Dr. A. E. Wagner performed the initial autopsy, completely unaware of who laid beneath the sheet on the autopsy table. He was shocked and horrified to find it was the dead body of his little neighbor, Marion. The conflict of interest clouded his judgment. He listed her cause of death as exhaustion and fright. I knew Marion Parker, explained the doctor. She was a nervous child. When she realized her situation, she probably neither slept nor partook of food during those three terrible days. So, side note, I was just thinking that maybe not only was Dr. Wagner shocked, but since he knew the poor child's parents, maybe he wanted them to be spared of the heartache of knowing how gruesome their daughter's death really was and how much pain she endured. She died only 12 hours earlier. Marion was very likely alive during the first attempted meeting. The child's limbs were severed and she was disemboweled. There was no sign of sexual assault and no evidence of drugs, such as chloroform or ether, in the child's system. The killer stuffed Marion's body with rags and sewed her eyes open. On December 18th, civilians walking in Elysian Park spotted bundles wrapped in newspaper secured with a length of twine. Inside were Marion's limbs and organs. At 620 Manhattan Street, a woman noticed a suitcase on her front lawn. It contained blood-soaked papers and a spool of thread, the same thread the killer used to sew Marion's eyes open. Police initiated a nationwide manhunt for Marion's killer, consisting of over 20,000 police officers and volunteers. Someone leaked the morbid details regarding Marion's manner of death to the press. The people of Los Angeles were enraged and feared for their children. The Parker family and generous citizens raised a $100,000 reward for the killer's identification and capture, dead or alive. During the investigation, police grew suspicious of Perry Parker's former employee, a young man named William Edward Hickman. William was a messenger boy at First National Bank who was convicted for forging stolen checks in June of 1927. He served time for the crimes, partially due to Perry's testimony. William was born in Sebastian, Arkansas in 1908. He was the youngest son of Eva and William Hickman. William grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, but his father deserted the family in 1925. William was a good student at Central High School, active in several clubs, including the debate team. On one of the telegrams from the killer, the address 2518 Birch Street, ALH, and ALH is a common abbreviation for the city of Alhambra, was scrawled in the bottom corner. The address turned out to be one that William lived at with his mother, Eva, the previous year. The towels crudely stuffed into Marion's abdomen were marked Bellevue Arms, the name of an apartment building located at 168 Bellevue Avenue in Los Angeles. 
On December 20th, police went there to investigate and encountered a man who fit the description of Marion's abductor. He identified himself as Donald Evans. Donald allowed the police to search his apartment, number 315. Police found no evidence, but Donald Evans disappeared. Investigators later learned that William Edward Hickman rented apartment 315. Undoubtedly, this was the man who killed Marion Parker. Police located the car used to get the ransom. The owners reported it stolen weeks prior in Kansas City, Missouri. Prints from the notes matched those found on the vehicle as well as fingerprints on file from William Hickman's previous arrest. Officers had no leads to William's whereabouts in the early part of the investigation. He wasn't back in Kansas, and he didn't go to his father in El Paso. A gas station attendant in Oregon thought he recognized William driving a green Hudson sedan. Then... In Seattle, a $20 ransom note was used to purchase cold-weather clothing. The police up north went on high alert. On December 22, 1927, Oregon police officers Chief Gurdain and Officer Lou Allen were enjoying a smoke break in Echo, Oregon, when an unmistakable green Hudson rambled by. Officer Lou Allen drove over 40 miles per hour with Gurdain on the running board until they were alongside the stolen Hudson. They pointed a pistol at the driver who half-heartedly gave chase but eventually pulled over. William didn't struggle when they arrested him. He only shrugged his shoulders and stated, Well, I guess it's all over. When Perry Parker learned of the arrest, he told reporters, I feel a sense of deep and sincere thankfulness that this man has been captured and that mothers no longer need fear that he may carry off their children. William admitted to the kidnapping right away. He blamed the murder on a friend named Andrew Kramer. Andrew, however, had an alibi. He was incarcerated at the time of Marion's death. After the arrest, LAPD extradited William to California by train. Detective Herman Klein traveled to Oregon to escort the prisoner. What do the people of California want with me? William wondered out loud. Herman gave an honest answer. They want your life. Rightly or wrongly, that's what they want. William gave a smug grin. Was it any worse than what Leopold and Loeb did? During the trip, he penned a 19-page confession to the murder of Marion Parker. His motive, he said, was that he wanted to go to college and needed tuition. William stated that he only killed Marion once she realized who he was. The two met before when she accompanied her father to work. William claimed he strangled her and dismembered her body to make it easier to conceal. Then he realized that Perry wouldn't pay for a child who was dead, so he filled her full of towels and sewed her eyes open to give the appearance of life. The trial began on January 25, 1928, in the court of Judge Trabuco. The not guilty by reason of insanity defense was new in California. William intended to use it and began behaving erratically. He would mumble to himself in his cell and pretend he couldn't hear people when they spoke to him. To complicate matters further, William confessed he murdered a pharmacist named Clarence Toms during a holdup with his buddy, Welby Hunt. Attorney Jerome K. Walsh represented William and agreed he should use the insanity defense. He relied on the testimony of mental health professionals, friends, and family who testified that William was insane. District Attorney Asa Keys wasn't about to let the defense get through a jury. He hired his own set of psychiatrists to argue that William was perfectly sane when he murdered Marion. Sure, William acted crazy. He said a supernatural being called Providence urged him to kill— but he also wrote to another inmate and asked how to act crazy. I've got to throw a fit in court, William wrote. I tend to throw a laughing, screaming, diving act before the prosecution finishes their case, maybe in front of old man Parker himself. Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author of Tarzan, went to the trial daily as a reporter for the Los Angeles Examiner. He formed the opinion that William was not insane, but a moral imbecile, who knew right from wrong and just didn't care. The jury shared this opinion. On February 9, 1928, William Hickman was found guilty of first-degree murder. The jury deliberated for only 36 minutes. William told the press, The die is cast and the state wins by a neck. I don't think I have much to live for and I don't know why I killed that Parker girl, but I did it and I'll take my punishment. On Valentine's Day, Judge Trabuco sentenced William to hang for the death of little Marion Parker. William laughed out loud. 
That sentence was carried out on the gallows of San Quentin on October 19, 1928. Before guards marched William to the gallows, he nibbled on a chicken dinner and listened to records on an old Victrola. He read letters from his mom and cried once. He asked a guard to hear his final confession. The confession expanded upon the others. He detailed Marion's last days. After three days of captivity, Marion began to get restless. William tied her to a chair in his apartment, and on December 17th, he went to mail a ransom letter. When he returned, Marion insisted he free her. She was starting to get loud, and William feared she might attract attention. William approached Marion from behind. He placed a towel around her neck and strangled her. He recalled how Marion squirmed and flailed for two minutes, give or take. Then she went quiet and limp. William dragged the child to his bathroom and laid her in the tub as he turned on the phonograph. William blared bye-bye, pretty baby, as he began carving her limbs with a butcher knife. He thought she might have been alive when he started. Side note, I will play the song that poor Marion heard as she was being dismembered. Hearing is the last thing to go, by the way. Have a good evening. Don't sigh, pretty baby.